Philippians chapter 2, and that's where we're going to have our point of departure. It's good to be here. I'd like to thank uh, Brother Richard for giving me the opportunity, as always, and, uh, and just a pleasure to be with you and fellowship with you all, of course, this week. It's been a good week, and uh, looking forward to the, to the rest of it. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul writes here to the Philippians, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for your grace, your love, um, all that you have provided for us in your Son. And Lord, I just pray that uh, as we continue uh, this session, that the focus is properly where it should be, on, the, on your Son and what he accomplished through us, uh, through the cross rather, and, and what he how that impacts us and how you live through us. And Lord, I just uh, rejoice in those truths and, uh, and thank you for that. Amen. Here in Philippians chapter 2, we, we see that Paul says in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning. Um, God has a lot to say about the way we think. God has a lot to say about our mind. And so do your wives sometimes, isn't that true? Brother Ray's got a saying, women spend more time thinking about what their husbands think than their husbands actually spend time thinking. <laughs> and God says, okay, well, I already knew that. I'll take care of that for you. I'll, I'll give them some clues. <laughs> God has a lot to say about the mind. God has a lot to say about the way we think. And he says a lot of it in the book of Philippians. And uh, this is a wonderful book to, to explore and to, and to dive in this week. Now, each chapter deals with some aspect of the mind, something that has to do with the mind. If you notice in chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, notice verse 27, Paul, Paul writes, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, notice, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Of course, we have here in chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Chapter 3, he's dealing with knowing Christ, knowing him, knowing the, the power of his resurrection, and, and, and so on. Notice what he says there down in, in verse Oh, verse 15, as he's, or actually look at verse 14, chapter 3, verse 14. Paul writes, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Chapter 4, you know the, the verse 8, it's, it's, a, it's a, a well-known verse. Uh, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, and whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, what? Think. We need to think, don't we? And sometimes our behavior doesn't line up with the way we should think. Now, the Philippians had that problem. They had some contentious moments and they had some strife. Come back with me to chapter 2. We know in chapter 4, he talks about Eodius and, and Sintichi, and, and he says, help those, those women which labored with me. And there was, there was some issues there. Now, when you read the book of Philippians, it doesn't seem all that apparent because he's dealing with mature saints. But see, Paul is, is reproving mature saints, and it looks quite different than when he reproves, say, the Corinthians. And so here in, in Philippians chapter 2, notice the language. He says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, and there is, if any comfort of love, and there is, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded. It kind of implies that maybe they weren't like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And so, so Paul is, is going to address, see, those are the desired results, verse 2, verse 3. That's the way that we ought to think towards one another. But when you get down to verse 5, that's what makes it work. There's something that we need to understand about the mentality and the thinking that Jesus Christ had as he went to the cross that's going to impact the way we think today towards one another. The, the way we think about his grace. 
Notice there, verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you. Let it be. Isn't that what Paul says? Let it be. Paul McCartney? Okay. Well, Paul... There's something that we need to understand about the the thought process, the thought pattern that Christ demonstrated on the way to Calvary and through Calvary that's going to help us understand the way God works and lives in us. Now, grab with me 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This morning we're going to look at how Christ demonstrated the thinking pattern of grace. Well, that's a fun study. Um, I, I'm, I trust we'll enjoy it this morning. How Christ thought, what his, what his thinking process was as he was obedient unto death, and how that is going to impact and does impact the way God lives in and through us. And as, as I was putting stuff together, it's exciting. It's really um, a great study, to, to just to see what the Savior did. And we know what Rick was mentioning uh, Saturday night, when you renew your mind. Aren't you glad you have a passage like Romans 5? Aren't you glad that you have a passage to rely on? You know, I think about the tongues movements and the, and the, and the speaking in tongues and the, and, and the signs and all that. You know what the problem with, with the tongue speaking is, to me? You can't call, that, you can't call on that to renew your mind. It doesn't edify you. You don't understand what it is. Just a bunch of babble. We know that. But just, just think of it that way. You can't call that to remembrance, and you can't find comfort and consolation in that. You can in God's Word. So aren't you glad you have passages like that, like Romans 5 and so on? We'll look at some of those. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. There's something I want you to know here, and we'll go back to Philippians 2. Something I want you to notice. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. Now, of course, the context here is, is giving and financial uh, business and so on. But 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 Paul writes here, for ye, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And Ted was talking last night about the riches of his grace and, and the exceeding riches of his grace and the riches of his mercy, and we see how wealthy we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. He became poor that we might be through his poverty, might be made rich. Back to Philippians chapter 2. Now notice, notice this poverty. Notice what he did to make us rich. It's Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. He says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And this is pretty cool, but I forgot to start, start the timer, so we got... I'm kidding, I'll be sensitive about that. <laughs> he was obedient, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, notice there in verse 6, he says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Is there any question as to who he is? No. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. John 1, uh, the book of John, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. And, and all, things that were made, uh, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And you read about it in Colossians chapter, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 there, For by Him were all things created whether they be things in heaven or things in earth, visible, uh, invisible, principalities, powers, uh, thrones, dominions. And I got that verse butchered, but you look at it, Colossians 1, 16. All things were created by him and for him. Who is he? He's the creator God. He's the possessor of heaven and earth. He's the most high. That's who he is, and there's no question as to who he is and his deity. Now, when you look at verse 7, we're looking at how God thinks. You realize that? When he says, let this mind be in you, this is what Almighty God thought and what he wants to work in us. 
Notice verse 7. But made himself of no reputation. By the way, is God going to demand that every being in heaven, in earth, even under the earth, have, you know, is he going to demand that every being in, in, in those spheres recognize the reputation of the Lord Jesus Christ? Of course, absolutely. Now, that's what we see there later on in the chapter in verse 9 and, and, and 10, the exaltation of Jesus Christ. But Christ comes and makes himself of no reputation. Notice, he chose to do that. See, grace chooses, and we're going to see that. Grace makes choices. And it makes choices to the end to see that our Father is pleased and glorified and that we seek to do His will. We're going to see that's, how, that's what grace accomplishes. Verse 7, but made Himself. This wasn't something that was forced upon Him. This was something that He chose to do. He made Himself of no reputation and took upon Him the form of servant. Here is the, He is the form of God. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Here He is. This is His deity. But instead of being the form of God, he comes in as the form of a servant. Grace serves. The thinking of grace serves and was made in the likeness of men. You think of that verse there in 1 Timothy chapter 2 where he says, there is one mediator between God and man, uh, man the man, Christ Jesus. You think about how, how big of a decision that was that Christ made. When he says, I'm going to come as a man to be their redeemer, that doesn't change. He's a, he comes as, as a man. He's still a man. That's wild. He's God. He's man. He's the God man. And that's what you see there in verse 6 and 7. What a, that's a big choice. Here you are and you're the word. You, you, you spoke and, and, and created. And you're going to come and such weakness and flesh, never to return. He's still got a man's body. Verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Don't you like how it says that? He became obedient unto death. It wasn't a noble death. It wasn't an awesome death. It wasn't a, a, a glorious death like in the movies with the big explosion and all that and the, and the hero and like Batman. No, it was a criminal's death. It was an accursed death. And he took that death for you and me. Pretty fascinating. Talk about weakness. He was crucified in weakness, 2 Corinthians 13 says. Yeah, he became poor that we through his poverty might be made rich. Now, I want you to notice a few things in, in, in verse 7 and verse 8. Notice he says in verse 7, he took upon him. Again, it's his choice. He took upon him the form of a servant. Notice verse 8, he became obedient. Well, who was he serving? And who was he obedient to? The Father, right. It wasn't us. I mean, he served us, believe it. I mean, <laughs> but he wasn't obedient to Charlie's will. Or anybody else's will, thank God. He was obedient to his father's will. We'll see that. Now, let's run a few passages in, in the book of, the book of John. You see this quite clearly. John chapter 4. Now, in, in, in Matthew through John, you don't read about Christ's attitude towards the body of Christ. You can't. Otherwise, Philippians chapter 3 wouldn't call it the unsearchable riches of Christ. But see, when Christ chose to become a man, when that, when that decision was made that this is how I'm going to redeem this creation, that was an attitude and a plan of grace. Remember Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace towards us who believe. He made a choice based on grace because there was a plan of grace that he had that impacts us today. John chapter 4, verse 27. John chapter 4, verse 27. Now, I just want you to notice the thinking that Jesus Christ had. John chapter 4, verse 27. And 
Upon this came his disciples. He was, he was talking to the, the Samaritan woman there. And, and, upon, and upon this came disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to, to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city that came unto him. Is the man, uh, in, the, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. And he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do what? To do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Chapter 5, verse 30. What I want you to just notice in these passages, I know we're breaking into the context and so on, and you understand why, but I just want you to notice what was Christ. You could see his mission. What was his focus? Chapter 5, verse 30. Chapter 5, verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Notice chapter 6, verse 37. Chapter 6, verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And he says, I came down from heaven to do what? The will, uh, yeah, the will of his Father. Notice John chapter 8. John chapter 8. You you read many, many passages like this in the book of John, which is fascinating. John 8, verse 27, or verse 26, rather. I have many things to say and judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Verse 28, then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things, and he that sent me is with me, and the Father not left, hath not left me alone, for I do always those things which please him. That was his attitude. That was the mentality. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Notice one other issue. John chapter 3, verse 35. John chapter 3, verse 35. Here's something else that the Lord seems to be consumed with. John chapter 3, verse 35, The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Notice in verse 35, he says, The Father loveth the Son. Chapter 5, verse 20. Chapter 5, verse 20. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself... Uh, doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that, that ye may marvel, and so on. Notice that Father loveth the Son. John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 17. And the reason we're going through so many verses is just to keep you awake. And then once you get irritated enough and ag- agitated enough where you can't sleep, then we'll <laughs> slow down a little. But John chapter 10, verse 17. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. What does the Lord seem to be consumed with? His Father's love and His Father's will. That's the mind that Christ demonstrated. That Paul in a sense, is dressing there in Philippians. And we'll see, we'll see that come together. Notice Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Here the Lord is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's about to be betrayed. And go to, the, and go to Calvary. Mark chapter 14, verse 33. 
And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. And what was that cup? That was the, that was the cup of the Lord's wrath. He says, take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. His mission, his purpose, his aim is constant. I seek to do always those things which please my Father. And I come to do the will of my Father. And Jesus, and the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrates what his will is. If this cup might pass, take it away. Nevertheless, whose will is the issue there? Whose will does Christ make the issue? It's the Father's. And he's not arguing with the Father. He's just struggling within himself. But he knows he, he's obedient unto death. Come, come back with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Come with me to Romans chapter 5, verse 19. Romans chapter 5, verse 19. We understand that Adam got us into a big mess. Don't you notice that sin never considers anybody else? Sin has no care or thought of how it impacts anybody else. It gratifies self. It causes damage upon damage upon damage. The first sin, a small sin, impacts all of humanity. That's pretty big. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And we know who is obedient. We know who is faithful. The obedience of Christ, the faith of Christ, it's his faith, it's his obedience that led him to take and drink of that cup. You and I had wrath coming. We were the children of disobedience. We were the children of wrath. And who took that wrath on our behalf? The Lord Jesus Christ. And aren't you glad? I know you are. By one man's obedience uh, shall many be made righteous. And he takes the cup of the Lord's wrath and he, and he drinks and, and, the, and, 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 and God forsakes him and, and God pours his wrath upon the Son that we don't have to, for, for the sake that we don't have to, that we could trust him and have his life. Notice there in verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned uh, reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. Don't you like how that's said? Much, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. You know righteousness is a free gift. Heaven is a free gift. Eternal life is a free gift. That's huge. Think about that. The gift of righteousness. You want to have a perfect standing with God, a right standing with God? Here it is, free. Romans chapter 3, verse 24, uh, for, the, for uh, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And he came and he was faithful and he was obedient and he died so that we don't have to. He gave his life so we could have his life. And he says, here's righteousness as a free gift. We can, we can see why we have problems with that at times and Lost people have problems with that at times. No one, <coughs> excuse me, no one likes to hear that you're unrighteous and you're guilty. Do you? Here we are, a bunch of believers, and no one likes to say, in and of yourself, you're unrighteous and dirty. You're a real creep. <laughs> but we are. I got a few amens. That's pretty cool. That's good. 
And he says, here's righteousness as a free gift. That's far out. Notice it's, it's his obedience. Now, I just quoted there a moment ago, Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Look at that. Being justified freely by his grace for the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, a definition that we're familiar with of, of grace is all that God is free, to, is, is free to do for us or provide for us through the finished work of, of Christ. And that's a great definition. And that's just a definition that comes right out of verse 24 there. All that God has provided for us through, through the finished work of His Son. I want you to think about grace in this vein, though. I want you to think as we, as we finish up here that grace is the gift of God's life free to us in Christ. It's the gift of God's life free to us in Christ. That's another way of saying the same thing, but I want you to just focus on that issue of life. Life is the issue. Romans 5.17 for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, notice, shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. And see, we receive the abundance of grace. We receive the gift of righteousness by faith. We place our, our trust and our rest and our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, His death, His burial, His resurrection. He died for our offenses, and He was raised again for our justification. And we trust in that, that message and that message alone, by faith alone, and praise the Lord. And He says, I want you to reign in life. Notice, not by your good works, not by the law, not by your, your faithfulness, not by your obedience, but by one, Jesus Christ. It's His life. It's his faith, it's his obedience, that's the issue. That's what we're going to see throughout here. But notice the issue of life. Life is the issue. What does grace produce? What does grace find? What is, what is the, the, the impact of grace? The law is death. Sin is death. Grace is life. That's the issue. He says that, I, that, that, that uh, you receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. The Lord wants us, every one of us, to reign in life. That's the issue of, of, of taking all that God has given us, all the provision that God has given us, and to extract the wisdom, the understanding, the knowledge from this book, an understanding of His grace, and enjoy it, and to use it. Reign. Have fun with it. You've got righteousness as a free gift. Go. And we're belligerent, <laughs> and we're difficult, and we complicate. Well, the grace of God teaches. It's okay. Notice Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. I want you to notice just the issue of, of grace and life. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Grace teaches us to, to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live. Reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Notice Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. There's a demonstration of how grace teaches us. I've gotten this question. I no doubt you have too. If you teach grace and if you teach what you're, what you're teaching, if you teach grace clearly, then you're giving people license to do whatever they want, to sin, to rebel, and not have to fear any sort of consequence. Well, grace doesn't say the natural consequences of sin don't matter. They do. But grace doesn't teach you to sin more. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Grace doesn't teach you to sin more. God doesn't hand out licenses to sin. Duh. He says, live. Yeah, duh. Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? It's a stupid question, but it's a normal one. Verse 2. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin? Notice, live any longer therein. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? 
Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. The issue there in Romans chapter 6 is you are dead to sin. Praise the Lord. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Life. Notice, keep reading, let's just go. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And that's an eternal issue. That's why it's called eternal life. Doesn't end. He liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. See, the issue is the grace of God teaches us how to live. It gives us life. It says, you want life? You want productivity? You want the favor and blessing and acceptance of God? You already have it because of his grace. Go, run, have fun. Learn about it, do it. And we'll come to chapter 7 in a moment. But you're, you're free from sin, and you're alive to God. That's pretty cool. So again, as we progress... Think of grace in this vein, and that is it's the gift of God's life free to us in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, we read, And you hath he quickened. He made alive. He's given life to and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Notice verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his, what? His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Salvation by grace is a gift. And we receive that gift and say thank you and praise the Lord and wow. In verse 10, God says, now I can get to work. Now I can work with something. Philippians chapter 2. We are his workmanship. I want you to just keep that in mind. If he, uh, Philippians chapter 2. Notice verse 13. Stemming from the context of where we started. Actually, notice verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Notice, for it is God which worketh in you both to what? To will and to what? And to do and what? Unto his good pleasure. What did the Lord Jesus Christ do? What did we look at? He says, I do always the things that please him. And I come to do the will of my Father. And it was that life and it was that mentality that was at work. And God says, now, now that I can provide eternal life to these folks, I can get to work. I can work in them. You have the gift of righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. And God's going to that's, our, that's, that's when man and God's grace meet, really. By the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And we receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. And God says, now I can work. Now I can do something with this person. Notice it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Grab with me Romans chapter 7, verse 18. Romans 7. Christ comes with an attitude and a mentality of grace 
to seek the benefit of another, to serve his father, to, to please his father. He was obedient unto death, and through his death we have life. And God says, I'm going to work now in those people to will and to do of my good pleasure. We'll see how that, that comes about. Notice Romans 7. I want you to notice a contrast. Because the great contrast with grace is law. And you could read a passage like Romans chapter 6 and say, all right, praise the Lord, very good. And then, you know, <laughs> we fall flat on our face because we're complicating things. And that's chapter 7. Now I want you to notice verse 18. Romans 7, verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Now, what's the problem there in Romans 7? Paul says, I've got the will, I've got the desire. You know, faith is not good intentions. Faith is not the will to do something. Faith is taking God at his word and applying it, or trusting it, or resting it, whatever it demands. He says, for the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. I've got the will, I've got the desire, I have the intention, but I have no way to do it. That's why God has to work in us to will and to do. Keep reading. For the good that I would, I, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Big deal. <laughs> you got to understand, Paul's attitude here, he is not giving you the perspective of a spiritual man. He's giving you the perspective of a saved man who's trying to please God by performing, by the law. And he says, how to perform, I find not. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. Notice the issue of the mind there. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You know, in Colossians there, it talks about will worship. That's what you're reading about. Do you serve God with your mind? Well, in some respects you do. But see, notice how he says it there. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. Someone's kind of stuck on himself, isn't he? Just like we can. See, trying to please God by means of the law never works. And God could never be pleased on the basis of a performance-based performance acceptance, as we say. Notice Romans 8. See, if all you had was Romans chapter 7, and that was it, you'd be in big trouble because he never gives you the answer. He just says, here's a problem, you dummy. <laughs> Quit it. Knock it off. But what's the answer? Verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. What does the law do? The law condemns. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The issue there is to walk. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Notice the issue there is life. You've been, you've been crucified with Christ. You're dead to sin. You're alive to God. You're also dead to the law so that you can bring forth fruit unto God, so that you can actually serve Him. And you don't serve Him by the oldest of the letter. You serve Him in newness of spirit. You serve Him by understanding something about His grace and the doctrine working in you. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled by us. No, huh. in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The issue there is walking after the Spirit. And walking after the Spirit is taking the doctrine of God's Word, the sound doctrine, having that in your thinking, in your understanding, believing it, trusting it, saying, that's right, and yielding your members accordingly. Trust what God says. He's right. And have that 
sound doctrine, make choices on the basis of a renewed mind. Now, come with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56. Paul says the law is just, it's holy, it's good. The law is not the problem, we are. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56. Notice, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. What does the law do? It makes sin stronger. It makes sin abound. And we say, well, I'm not eating a certain kind of dietary, I don't have a certain dietary plan. Well, maybe you do, but but not like the one back there in, in, in the law. And I don't, all the ceremonial laws and the civil laws and so on, I don't follow that, you know. This is the church age. But you know, you got to be conscious of the moral law, don't you? The Ten Commandments. Don't you need to know the law of God? And see, Paul says, that doesn't work. The issue isn't you trying to keep a law by the way, don't we have our own laws? The Gentiles do. Israel had their own law. And we put under people, we put people under unrealistic expectations, our own laws. They can't meet it, and then we get angry when they fail. We put ourselves under our own laws and expectations, and we fail. January 1st, duh. <laughs> he says, the law strengthens sin. Notice Romans chapter 4, verse 15. Romans 4, verse 15. I just want you to see, I know you're familiar with these verses, but God's got a different operating program. Romans chapter 4, verse 15. Or read verse 14. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. For where no, tra for where no law is, there is no transgression. What does the law do? What does the law produce? It produces wrath. It produces death. It produces condemnation. Why? Because the law does that? Because the law is bad? No, because we're bad. We fail. And the law just points out every failure and every shortcoming of man. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Let me ask you, are you righteous? Yes, I am made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. I have the gift of righteousness. It's a free gift. Did you know that? The law is, is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy, for profane, for murderers, for fathers and uh, uh, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men's dealers, for liars, for perjured persons, uh, and, and, uh, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. He says, that's what the law was for. Not for you to please God. Notice back there in Romans chapter 8. Come with me to Romans 8 real quick, and we'll tie things together and finish up here. Romans chapter 8, verse 6, he says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And if we choose to do anything else, to live the Christian life apart uh, from the basis of the grace of God and what that teaches us, we can't please God. There's one person who only ever pleased God. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And whose life do you have? I have Christ's life. That's the life that he's talking about. God would never be pleased if we were under some sort of performance. And the righteous character that the law demands, the righteous character that, that shouts and screams and says, I demand perfection and I demand righteousness, is silenced by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. See, the character and the conduct of God. 
It's fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Not by keeping some law, not by performing, not, not any of that. The law works wrath. The law brings condemnation. How can you please God under those circumstances? And God says, I put that away. I abolished it. I nailed it to my cross. Here's my grace. Here's life. Go, run, enjoy. Come with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. And this has been mentioned before. How, do you, how did you receive? By grace through faith. And how will you walk? By grace through faith. See, the issue is God's grace always. Rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. There are some things that we need to learn. There are some things that we need to understand. The grace of God teaches us. And we need to understand the sound doctrine from this book. Get that into our thinking. Have a renewed mind. And make choices based on that, on the grace of God. The great grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Didn't we look at that in Romans chapter 6? You are dead to sin. You are crucified with Him. Your old man's crucified. You're dead to sin. You're dead to the law. Quit it. And here's my grace. And learn from my grace. Learn about the gift of God's life through Jesus Christ. The issue isn't how do I gain favor? How do I gain acceptance? How do I gain blessing? You already have it. See, grace is not something that you live in order to attain something by, by based on your progress. Grace is something that you live based on the provision that God has given you in His Son. Quite different. You live out of your wealth. You live out of the riches of His grace. You don't live to attain the riches of His grace. You have it in His Son. Very different. It's no wonder why Paul calls those things, the, the, the law, weak and beggarly. That's exactly what it is. Isn't that amazing? God gave a law. 2 Corinthians 3 talks about this. He gave a law, and it's weak and beggarly. Not because the law is the problem, it's because we are the problem. And the law is, is weak in the flesh. Isn't that amazing how much greater... His grace is. You're there in Colossians. Look at chapter 1, verse 9. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and a desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His what? His will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. See, there's God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure, that you be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy and all pleasing. That's the issue. We are God's workmanship. Notice Romans chapter 5, verse 2. The grace of God is a doctrine. It is an attitude and a thinking pattern. And it's a way of life. The issue with God's grace is life. He demonstrated His grace through His Son and what His Son accomplished through Calvary. And we receive the gift of grace. And we live and operate on the basis of His grace. On the knowledge of here's Here's my life now as a result of trusting Him. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Back, back to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. He says by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. You stand in God's grace. You can't be moved from that. Access it by faith. The Philippians needed to access that grace. When contentions and strifes and so on come up, and they do, 
We need to ask the question, well, how does God's grace deal with this? You ever ask yourself that question? Here's a problem. Here's a, here's a circumstance. It could be vile. It could be inconvenient. It's a problem. And this is what my flesh wants to do. <laughs> here's a hammer, here's a baseball bat, here's a chainsaw, you know. You guys know what I'm talking about. I'm not the only one. But our flesh has one response. It's the law. The law punishes. See, grace, grace is not the issue of punishment. Grace is the issue of what, what happened at Calvary. And I'm going to deal with issues on the basis of what, what the cross took care of. And our flesh says, let's get them. The wrong, the wrong, if someone else was wrong or if you were wrong. Our flesh has one response. But you need to ask the question, well, what would God's grace do about the situation? And you know, it always centers around Calvary. That's the one constant thing. Grace is always found at the cross. It starts there. The Philippians need to access that grace. They needed to, and so do we. Problems are known. The law, performance, the expectations that we place on people that they can't meet doesn't work for God and doesn't work for us. What works is when we live out of a provision and the wealth that God has given us in His Son. Colossians chapter 3, verse 4 says, Christ who is our life. When He shall appear, then shall we also appear with Him in glory. Isn't that cool? Isn't that, isn't that neat? He is our life. He's not a part of your life. He's not something that He had done to your life. He is our life. Grace is the issue of life. Grace is the issue of what's the will of my Father? And I seek to please Him out of gratitude for what He accomplished at Calvary. So let His Son be your life and heart's desire. He says, set your affection on things above. Now that's chapter 3, and that's, that's Ron's message for tomorrow. That's such a cool chapter. It was His love, His service, His death. It was His grace, and it's in that grace that we live our life and, and, and serve God. Isn't that great? But they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. He is our life. It's His grace. And we live, by, we live on the basis of that by faith and sound doctrine. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for, thank you for Your grace. Thank You for loving us. For dying for us. For giving us your life freely. I pray we take that to heart and enjoy it. Amen.